welcome, thanks. Welcome everybody to our session about working with contributor communities. Um, my name is Christoph Wickert. I was asked to be here for the Fedora project. Um, but then I recommended that Jörg will do the Fedora stuff and I'm going to be your host to today. Um, I'm completely biased, that's why I'm not going to say much, I'm just the moderator and uh, I think we should just kick off with a quick introduction. Uh, we have different people here representing different projects and each of them is supposed to introduce their project within say three minutes each or say five minutes but we really need to hurry up uh, because after that we want to have a discussion say a round table where we discuss the things that work well in the one or other project and the things that don't. So I think we should just kick off with a brief introduction, all the people introduce them, themselves quickly and then we get right into the, uh, into the distribution introductions. All right, ladies first. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Tchaikovsky. I'm from Ireland, but living in London at the present, and I'll be representing the Ubuntu community. Um, do we start the slides now? Or? Just pass okay. the mic along okay. and pass then... The mic along. Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Kosas Kudaras. I'm here to represent the, the open source community. That's all. Hi, everybody. I'm Stefano Zaccheoli, and I represent here the Debian project. Hi. <coughs> My name is Oliver Burger, and I represent the Magea project. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Peter Radu and I'm from Gen2. Good morning, I'm Jörg Simon, I represent the Fedora project. All right, I think we start here with Laura. Um, I already have your slides on the... So, go ahead, um, you need your slides or... Yes. I mean... Yes, I don't want to. Okay, I press the button, I do the really important stuff. Yeah, grand up. So I'm going to talk about the Ubuntu community. Um, for those of you who don't know about us, we're um, quite a much large enough community at present. We're full of um, loco teams. That's how the, just the community's broken up. Um, so there are over 152 loco teams worldwide. That means every country or every city in, in the States has a loco team. Um, there's two ways of doing communities for us. We do it virtual way and real life way. So the real life way for us is through loco teams. Um, you don't know? The logo team's main point for their, their whole purpose of is to do advocacy, translations, bug trans triaging, documentation, or install fests or global jams. So they take part in local events, they organize their own events, or they take part in the greater global community for the Ubuntu. Um, so this is actually a community project that was totally driven by us. It's called loco.ubuntu.com. And on there is a purpose resource for local teams. They can put all their information, the wiki contact, the website information, forums. And we also put all of our events onto the next page. So as I said, there's over 140, 152 teams worldwide. This was developed by Ubuntu Loco team members. Um, and this was a feature that was added for us because people want to put all their resources on one page. So if I was traveling to... France or Italy, I could look on the local team page and see what kind of events they're holding. Um, we put local team events on there, we put international events. So we have an international event called an Ubuntu hour and many teams meet up once a month for an hour in a coffee shop just chatting about Ubuntu. And it's quite nice and it's very friendly and very laid back. It's different from actually having a conference. Um, the next slide there is another event. We have global jams. We hold them twice a year in between our release cycle, just before the next release candidate. We get together, we do translations, bug triaging, and just taking part in reporting bugs and getting people more involved in the Ubuntu community. Um, next one. So yes, that's what our actually aims for. Um, we basically then approve them or unapproved teams. They come forward to the local council, which I sit on, which is a board made up of six people, and we are elected for a two-year term. Um, this is my second term for being elected to it. Um, and we basically help and guide teams. If they need merchandise from Canonical, we have set up that they can get a conference pack. If they're approved or unapproved, they get different gifts. Um, something we worked on about two years ago was to get them a gift, a once-off gift from Canonical, that when they're approved, they get a banner and a tablecloth, which may not seem very much, but it makes them really kind of professional looking if they're going to conferences and taking part, which is quite nice. Um, and finally, 
I think, yes. Those are just some links that I just said I put up that would help people if they were looking for things later on. And we basically get local team members to introduce the rest of their community into the greater global community. Um, so we have Ubuntu Learning, Beginners Teams, Open Days and, and User Weeks, where members from the local teams take part and maybe give a session on how to get involved in the community, how to do bug documentation or triaging. And they show that to their members, because all our sessions are logged in IRC. And then we can send that link out to our members and say, this is what was taken part if you couldn't make the IRC session. And we try and get people more and more involved in the greater global community. Um, that's for me, and I'll pass it on so you can get going. Okay, okay. okay. it's shorter than a speech dog. So, uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to that, as I said before. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the OpenSUSE Ambassador Program. Uh, our program is uh, not as well de as developed as the other uh, as the other projects like Budo or Fedora. Uh, it's uh, can you change the slide? Uh, the facts ab uh, about uh, the Ambassador Program is that we have uh, 165 ambassadors in 51 countries. Uh, we have a mailing list, but uh, most of our uh, ambassador issues are discussed in uh, the marketing. Uh, in uh, marketing meetings. Uh, it's uh, pretty easy to become an open social ambassador, and that's something we would like to fix nowadays. Uh, also, uh, one of, of the bad things, uh, fairly bad things, that uh, the program has is uh, that, uh, unfortunately, many people nowadays uh, use the ambassador program in order, uh, as a starting, using that as a starting point uh, to enter the open social community. Uh, goals, the goals of the ambassador program. Uh, the goals of the ambassador program uh, is uh, are very uh, are not uh, very spe specific. Yes. Okay. Uh, the current uh, goals are uh, act as an evangelist uh, of the open source project to the public, and may, and actually you don't have to be an ambassador to do that. Uh, mentor new users and contributors, uh, support uh, open source local events, uh, promote open source and contribution to the open source project. Also, having a lot of fun. Uh, nowadays, uh, me along with uh, Richard Brown are working in reconstructing uh, the open source program, since we believe that uh, we have a, uh, we can uh, make uh, great improvements and uh, make sorry too much coffee. Uh, and uh, make this a better project so that uh, people uh, actually contribute more than uh, having getting a title of uh, being an ambassador and then actually do one or two things every year. Uh, we want uh, to make the ambassador program a starting point for people that uh, actually want to work and uh, want to attract uh, contributors to the open source project. Was Debian Okay, so um, Debian community in terms of developers, in terms of official project members, is very large and very scattered around the world. So we are about 1,000 developers, which which can be found all over the world, mostly in Europe, in the United States, developing in South, uh, South Africa, in Asia, in Australia. But on the other end, the, we don't have a real structure for uh, gathering and to fostering the creation of local groups in specific part of the world. So next, please. So the current structure is that we have uh, a lot of mailing lists which are used by local communities to work on specific topics. So for instance, we have a, a user discussion list in specific languages like Debian France or Debian Italian or Debian German, and those are contact points for users to uh, have a virtual place where to discuss uh, issues or their or they their so what they are doing with Debian. This is mostly user focused. Then we have also a plenty of developer mailing lists in specific languages, and this this helps for people who want to approach Debian development but maybe are not that familiar with English. 
uh, we also have a lot of translation activities which goes on on mailing lists. So we have the Debian L10N uh, set of mailing lists which are mostly used to work on the translation of Debian specific content in several languages. And we have a quite new activity which is meant to offer mailing lists for local groups, but it's very new. So we just have like three mailing lists for local meetings uh, around the world. Uh, then we have something which is rather ad hoc. So on the wiki, some users started to uh, flock together and create local contact points around the world. So there is a, essentially a wiki page where you, local groups can declare themselves and point to their specific resources. And we have on completely different level what we call Debian trusted organization. So Debian as a project is not backed by any specific company. So we have the need to have associations around the world which hold our assets and we have them around the world but it's not really, some are used to promote Debian but most of them exist only to, to hold Debian as assets. So we have quite some issues with this structure. So first of all, it's too much ad hoc. So there is no real structure that, uh, first of all, advertises the possibility of creating a local Debian group in your area. And there is no um, incentive. So people who, who start up creating a local group do that just because they, they love Debian, but there is no, no way for the project to actually give, encourage them to do so. And as a consequence of that, uh, while Debian developers are, are all around the world, the local Debian groups are very, very little, are not covering the whole world. So there are plenty of places where you will not be able to find a local Debian interest group. So this is the first problem. And the second one is that we are scattering our sources. So a lot of groups, what they are doing are creating their non-official uh, website, fan, fan site for Debian, their unofficial forum, their unofficial wiki, their unofficial IRC channel. And we have the impression that doing this, we are actually wasting some of the efforts in the community. Next, please. So um, we, we want to fix this. So I must say I'm here mostly to learn from other projects which have a, a more developed structure for local groups. But what I want to share with you is the, the goal we are setting ourselves for this, this initiative. So for us, the, the first uh, goal is to actually two things. So encourage groups to, to form spontaneously. So let's say we have people who are enthusiastic about Debian around the world. We want them to know that they are welcome to create a local group in their area. And then also to have some mechanisms to keep alive those groups, because it's fairly easy that groups create and then the interest of the, the main driving person fade away. And so we want them to, to keep them alive. I want to find the right incentive to do so. And what are the goals of the groups for us? So first of all, reduce the gap among users and developers. So there is a sort of chasm among a simple user and developers, and it's fairly difficult to pass from a user or developer. And we believe that local groups that can meet face to face can be a good way to make it easier to cross this, this chasm from uh, users to developers. And uh, also we want to ensure some Debian present, presence at local events, and we want a place, a directory, where it's easy to find an answer to the question, okay, I'm interested in Debian and I live in this specific area. Who should I contact if I want to work with people on Debian, if I want to uh, organize Debian event in that area? This question is a question that people often pose to me as a Debian project leader, and I often don't know how to answer. So this is the things we want to fix. And the third problem we'd like to solve with a more organized structure is to actually have some mechanisms to avoid conflict. So for instance, we want to avoid situation in which for a specific area of the world, a specific country, or a specific region for very big countries, uh, we want to avoid that there are two competing groups saying, okay, I want to be the local Debian group, so who is winning? So we want to avoid this kind of long conflicts, but if they will ever arise, we want to have a, a light governance model that helps us in fixing that. Thanks. Okay, um, just a reminder, let's, let's uh, hurry up a little. Let's yes. start with the general <coughs> stuff, but about the what makes your pro project special. Okay. Um, the PDF at the left. Okay. Um, we are a fairly, fairly new project, so, so, uh, so the situation is we don't have a real local community team yet. It's something that just has to be established. Next, please. But um, we do have quite a lot of local communities in several countries. Um, could you please? So the biggest ones are in France and Germany. France is the country most of Magyar people come from, and Germany is uh, our second uh, stronghold. Uh, but there are also groups in Poland, Greece, Italy, Spain, in Brazil. I don't know about the United States uh, or Australia or Canada or th something like that. Uh, so our main goal is to get organized. And so my main goal here is to see what others do and how they do it to learn from them. Okay. 
So, little thing about Magea and how those uh, local community teams will be uh, fitting into our overall structure. Uh, so we have uh, two bodies. The one is the association doing all the legal stuff, uh, holding the assets, uh, um, to, uh, taking donations and things like that. And the other one is the Magea project with the council leading it. And the council is made up of representatives of each team. So translators, developers, packagers, uh, artwork, marketing, whatsoever. And a local community team would fit in to that left section. So uh, the local community team would have the same voice as a packager team or as an internationalization team and so on. Okay. Um, now, as I just said, we are organized in teams, and every team has the same voice. Every team has one representative in council, and the council is the body that is actually doing the decisions. Um, okay, I just said that. Um, okay, that is uh, the point that is rather imp important to us. We don't want to have only the technical people ruling the Magea project. We want to have everyone who is contributing having the same voice in the project. That's why we decided not to leave any team out as soon as it forms up. Um, and so a local community team would have the same voice as every other team as well. And um, our idea is to, to um, create a team that actually represents all those local communities we have. So each local community uh, can send, uh, uh, can elect a leader, which they normally do have, and those leaders uh, will select a representative who will represent all the teams in the council. If this works, I don't know. Um, we have to check, we have to see. It's uh, something we will try to do this year to get uh, an overview of what we have, because up to now uh, we mostly know about uh, what the French and the German, the Italian and the Spanish groups do. Uh, we don't really know what uh, groups in Greece and in Poland and in Brazil do, and we want to change that. that uh, not to tell them you have to do this or that, but just to be informed and to, be, to have a central point where the teams can ask for help if they need it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, I don't have any slides, but I can just talk. Uh, <clears throat> originally, Donnie Bergfels was uh, supposed to be here, but then uh, in the end, I guess my name ended, ended up there. But uh, from Gentoo, we have um, like 200 developers. We don't have any local stuff. So um, it, there's a good question at what point in the size of the organization you want to start splitting up to local things. But in Gentoo, everyone can, those who do translation and things there, it's all a big group of 200 people. Uh, so, <clears throat> but so far it's worked fine, and every can, everyone can start new projects under Gentoo. So if one, someone wants to form a local team, they, they could do it. Um, but uh, uh, as far as backing goes, there's like Debian, it's, uh, there's uh, very little money to go around, um, much l uh, less money to go around than Debian, the foundation. Uh, why so, uh, as a f for in contrast to for Canonical, uh, there's uh, fewer opportunities to buy um, stuff around the world and ship it there. Um, so, thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't, don't uh, really know why Christoph chose me, because my English is very bad, so I'm sorry Because for that. basically <laughs> you built up the whole project, <laughs> that's why you were chosen. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the Fedora ambassadors are um, yeah just a small subset uh, of the of around twenty five thousand uh, Fedora account holders, but I think it uh, represents the project very good because from all the groups like packagers, artwork, marketing, uh, translation, they are all also ambassadors and they can join uh, can join this group, and yeah, this is the ideal role model uh, that we would have in an ideal world. So we uh, don't see ambassadors uh, not only as uh, yeah, doing events or uh, doing some marketing. We uh, are also want them to doing HR. So find the right contributor for the right task is really important. And yeah, to have some people who get recognized um, 
oh, this is the guy from Fedora, so give them a face and a name. Yeah, and of course, um, they should have some work in the Fedora project, so they are not only ambassadors, they should be yeah, doing some stuff. As example, I do the Fedora Security Lab beside my work as a Fedora ambassador. Um, yeah, we are organized with a steering committee, which is elected um, by the Fedora ambassadors. Um, Christoph, I do not know if you try to change that, so the whole project will it, elect it. It will, it will be continue to be elected, I think. Okay. I'm so the chair of, the, of FAMSCO. So then we have the uh, ambassador membership administration, who is doing all the administration stuff, but also develops the mentoring process. Uh, and we have uh, around 12 mentors uh, around the world who are, yeah, mentor new candidates and decide if he's ready to become an ambassador. And yeah, and then we have the regional leadership. Yeah, it's not really teams, it's more informal leaders. So we have credit card holders uh, who can pay for their local community. Um, yeah, right now we are yeah, 500, uh, over 500 ambassadors, um, but there are some inactive accounts uh, in this number. So I think we are 540. Uh, so uh, you see also uh, we developed since uh, 2005 and we were more than 800 people, but we make some cleanups uh, every three years. So we clean up the inactive accounts and yeah. Um, yeah, this is a number we start, uh, since we started with the mentoring program, um, we got, oh, I need, a, I need classes. <laughs> Uh, we had 1, uh, nearly 1,600 membership requests, and uh, from this uh, request, only 295, right? Is this, I, I can't see 295. It. Yeah. This is, these were sponsored? Yes. And these were not? Yeah. And they these are make still, it, uh, still into, into ongoing issues. Yes. And uh, on, the, on the right side, you see... Uh, the, the yellow line is, uh, so we, we sponsor 10 ambassadors every month. So this is just some slides how we developed, uh, how it started in 2006. Uh, yeah, we became uniforms in 2008. And yeah, and now we are a very large, good developed uh, community. And maybe some numbers also to the events. So we are doing 183 uh, events in 2010, and you can see how it growed. And then uh, you see the budget. Uh, we have a budget around $100,000 uh, per year to making events. And uh, here's the distribution of events in percent uh, for, for the budget and uh, what events we or how much events we do with the budget and how it's spread it uh, around APEC, EMEA, LATAM, and North America. That's it. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. I think that was enough to give you a brief idea of the different uh, uh, projects we have. Um, I would now like to have an open discussion about what makes this uh, project different. I mean, from the Fedora point of view, with my Fedora hat on, I can say, one thing that makes the Fedora Ambassador program very special is the strict mentoring. Only one out of four makes it to become an ambassador. Uh, I'm not sure if other distributions have anything like that. Um, do you just take everybody or do you just... Uh, how many candidates apply every month or...? So, our distribution... Yeah. Work, right. So Ubuntu is a bit different that way. We have Ubuntu Loco teams and we have Ubuntu membership. Um, so at the moment we have over 700 members um, worldwide and those have gone through uh, a process where they've gone to an, an interview panel on IRC either through um, Europe, Americas or Asia. Um, and those are our Ubuntu members. But anybody can be involved in Loco teams. You don't have to be an Ubuntu member. Uh, and with regards to mentoring, different groups, so documentation, translations, Ubuntu women all have their own mentoring project. So it's different that way. Um, the local teams are just the local communities. It's not that you have a dedicated project who are just doing 
spread the word uh, who are going outside? Like, I mean... So, um, again, local teams, they, they have to remain active and they're more than a lug. They have to prove that they're uh, promoting Ubuntu and only Ubuntu. Um, but some Ubuntu teams are do interact with other communities. So I do know the Italian Loco um, operates really well with the Debian community and they hold a lot of joint conferences. So that's a great resource to have both communities joining together. Um, but mostly like a Loco team would work on their own translations for their team. So um, French, German translations, they do great work there and they kind of mentor one another. Uh, and sometimes if we're fortunate enough, they grow their community up to the larger governance. So like I'm from Ireland but I also sit on the community council, the local council, and the membership board in Europe, uh, and different people get more involved. So re related to that, I wonder which kind of mechanism are you people using in general to, um, to verify if people are still active? So well, we have seen that your numbers go down because I guess at some point you check if people are active anymore, and I guess we have something similar. Yeah, so, uh, and I'm interested to see if you try a different solution and which one worked best for you. Um, I can say this for Fedora. I mean, uh, we had this uh, in the past. Uh, people were not really active on the mailing list, and somebody s then said, please reply to this mail if you're still alive and kicking. And suddenly they all showed up again. And that was endless threats on the mailing list. There was not, yes, I'm still alive. I am still here. I still work for Fedora. No, you don't. But anyway, people were arguing, and we were arguing about introducing the status of an inactive ambassador. So I say I have to work for university or something. I mean, you can become inactive. Uh, we don't throw you out of the project. But meanwhile, we have, say, a natural cleaning up mechanism because you have to change your SSH keys and your password like every six months or something. Or we had a major, uh, we had a, we have exchanged all SSH key in the Fedora account system. And people were given time, like three months, to do this. And if you haven't changed your password after three months, uh, then you are no longer. The, the accounts are still in the account system, but they are suspended. They can reactivate them at any time if they decide to come back, but they are uh, inactive uh, in the account system, and therefore their membership is its not come to an end, but it's, yeah. We don't have uh, nothing like this. Uh, actually, everybody can become an ambassador in OpenSUSE, and that's a problem. And that's uh, why we're now rewriting the ambassador program, because uh, we have uh, 165 ambassadors, and we have uh, less than... Uh, 50% active. Uh, many people become ambassadors and then forget that. They, have, they are just a name in the list. So uh, uh, also this, cause, this causes people that uh, are actually active uh, in the project and uh, can lead, uh, and lead local teams and uh, lead uh, tries, uh, trans, uh, they have translators around them and make great work and not becoming an ambassador because uh, many people think that uh, being an ambassador is uh, like nothing. Uh, and now that is why we're, we're trying to reconstruct the whole idea, uh, because uh, anyway, when uh, the ambassador program, when the Open Social Ambassador program started, uh, it uh, was uh, it, it they, they didn't give it uh, any thought. They said, uh, I th in my mind, I say they thought, oh, if I don't have an ambassador program, let's make an ambassador program for ourselves. But uh, nobody can uh, deny someone to become. I'm a member of uh, the ambassador welcome team for Open Social. And uh, we cannot actually deny someone to become an ambassador. So practically everybody can do that. Uh, and that uh, causes problems. We hope in the next months we will change all that. We're writing that. So, okay. Um, so yeah, just to touch back on that. Um, so again, because Ubuntu has grown, and we, did, we started off I mean, putting all our events on wiki pages and all our teams on wiki pages, and through governance and kind of people wanting to get more and more involved, we have ended up with loco.ubuntu.com. Dot com, which is our local team portal. You know, we have started off smaller and we have grown. Um, it's not perfect, we're still tweaking it. With regards to membership, again, um, to become a member, you have to go through a process and go through an application board, but you get a notification every two years to renew your membership, and if not, you're expired. So that's one way of cleaning up. Um, when you become a member, you get an IRC cloak, and the IRC council at the moment are doing a spring cleaning of all the cloaks that have expired. So there are, we do, do try and keep it as up to date as possible with regard to those ways, and, and the same way our planet Ubuntu gets updated as well. So the, default mechanism, the default mechanism is you need to declare explicitly if you are active, otherwise you are expire yeah. after some you time. expire after two years in the launch pad. Um, sorry. Uh, what's, the what's the link between membership and local teams then? So, okay. 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 So, 
Um, anybody in the world can be a part of an Ubuntu Loco team. Um, if you go to the Loco team portal, you can see if there's a community nearby and you can take part and join their mailing list and just join their IRC channel or forums. Um, to become an Ubuntu member, you have to show sustained activity in the Ubuntu community. So that if that is through advocacy, I'm not a developer, um, I don't code, but I do through advocacy and I get people involved and I organize events and I try as much as I possibly can to promote Ubuntu on my machine or giving a talks or handing out CDs. Um, and different people do different things to warrant membership. And we put them through two different ways. We do through, through like say maybe advocacy and non-development ways. And we also go through developer ways. So Motu, the developer membership board. So there's two different ways of getting membership in Ubuntu. Uh, and those are, but anybody can be part of a Loco team. We don't turn anybody away. There's also a generic mailing list called Loco Teams. And anybody can join it and just listen to it. It's a low traffic mailing list. Okay, any more? I, I would continue with questions that show our, if, if you have any questions, I think first, and then we continue with questions from the audience. Uh, 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 how much importance uh, do you think it has that uh, the financial background of uh, its uh, distribution to the development of uh, local or general communities? Um, so, I want to just state for clarification, Canonical doesn't give Loco teams any money. Um, any Loco team operates on their own way of fundraising. So, I do know that the Belgium Loco may have sold some stuff this weekend that would raise money for their team to buy CDs for the next event. Um, in Ireland, we got pins for our T-shirts. We sold them at two euros. That's money for our next event. We don't get any financial money from Canonical for Ubuntu. The only thing we do get is CDs. Um, Yes, but that's not canonical. Yes, but that we're saying from the head. Um, the lady was just clarifying that the Brazilian loco has money. But what I'm saying is canonical doesn't give us, yes. If I may, so Debian is possibly lack in terms of donation because it's a quite visible project, so we do get quite a fair amount of money donated to us. But I would say that in terms of creating the community, the money are not very useful. So it might be useful to promote stuff. And yeah. the biggest difference I see between a non-profit st standpoint like Debian and a for-profit standpoint is that we, we, we will not, for instance, give things for free at booth. So at best, we give them at the price of the, co of the production cost. But in the end, in terms of the effectiveness of the promotion, I don't think that specific part changes yeah, significantly. But, but my question is, uh, uh, how it does, uh, is this helpful in order to evolve a community, to make a better community? Or uh, do you think that uh, this is not one of the things that you actually need? <coughs> well, as a kind of new community project without uh, very much funding, I think <coughs> You can grow a rather good community without any money and getting the money along the way by donations. Um, I think if, if you don't have any financial background, uh, you will only have the people who are really into the project because they have to pay for everything out of their own account. Um, while if you say, okay, uh, we can't pay you your travel expenses or something like that, uh, you will have more people who are going to an event, but uh, perhaps not better quality of people. Uh, as far as money goes, it, uh, for example, in a lot of open source projects, there's students involved. And so for them, uh, paying at their own expense, uh, you get to get better quality people if you're sponsoring students and things like that. I, I think it's really important to uh, help people to travel to events, to meet there, or make activity days to get something done. Uh, and I want to ask the uh, Ubuntu lady. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot your name. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, if you raise money uh, from selling some Ubuntu stuff, uh, do you have an NPO for that? or? Yeah. yeah. The question is about a legal entity because yeah. we have that a problem in Fedora. We don't have a legal entity. That's why we cannot uh, sell swag or something because we are not so allowed to earn money. Um, some loco teams have set up organizations because they have to have a bank account. Um, I know in Ireland, all we did was it was small. It was maybe we had about 60 euros, maybe 80 euros at a time. And we'd use that maybe for a global jam to get some pizzas and some food afterwards. It's not that ex extravagant. 
Um, other teams have become very much organised. They've had chairs, treasuries, bank accounts, signatures, and that gets an awful lot bureaucratic, to be honest. For me, I don't find it any useful. But for them, for their country, if they need to raise money, they have to do it that way. For the local council, we can't sell them. They can't do it that way because they want to raise funds for their community and that's how they need to do it. So again, every team, local team, does things differently in their community to a certain degree. If I can give a suggestion on, there, so on that, so Debian has a legal entity, actually, and full of them. Yesterday, there have been a wonderful legal issue track here at FOSDEM in which it was a talk about uh, specifically this point on non-profits organization which help free software projects. There are plenty of them that are happy to accept other projects and the talks have been recorded and will be available on the podcast run by Bradley Kuhn and Karen Sandler. So there are a lot of, uh, before starting your own association, look around. There are plenty of organizations already able to do that fairly efficiently for you. Um, um, about that point, uh, I just heard this morning uh, from one of our Greek guys that for example, in Greece, uh, there is a, a Linux association, there, and their only reason of existence is to be the legal entity for all the Linux user groups there are in Greece. So there is one organization that does all the legal work for all the rest. So not every project does have to create its own legal uh, uh, entity. Um, I think it's. It's good to have a, a legal entity on, on top of, of the, the overall organization like Fedora uh, has with, with uh, the, or is Fedora itself a legal uh, the, entity? The trademark uh, is owned by Red Hat. Mm. Okay. So the Fedora trademark is owned by Red Hat, and so Red Hat is the main sponsor um, for, well, yeah, for Fedora, and uh, as I said before, um, we have to go all through the processes uh, in Red Hat. So if we want to spend money, we spend Red Hat money. And um, we have to file uh, budget reports. And that's often very bureaucratic. And uh, if you want to, we, we had a legal, legal entity. Um, I think, uh, Gerold, when was it closed down? Two years ago, we had to close down uh, the German legal entity, or yeah, uh, Fedora EMEA. Um, and now the processes uh, to get money are not the shortest way. So some, um, well, it, we didn't have to close it down, but uh, the Red Hat, the, the uh, I mean, Red Hat is an American country. They need to uh, protect their trademark very aggressively even if they protect it against their own people, basically, against their own community. And we were given the choice, either you rename your foundation to something generic, not with the Fedora name in it, or you won't get any money any longer from us. And that's why we uh, canceled, canceled this. And I think this brings up another interesting question, uh, mainly for, for Magyar or for Ubuntu as well. What is the relation to your commercial sponsor? I mean, the relation between uh, Mandriyavara and Magyar is not the best. We all uh, know that. <coughs> okay, uh, <laughs> let's, let's first say that there isn't any relation between Mandriva and Magyar. Um, Mag uh, you told us yesterday about some things, but you just were not specific at all. You just had a few ideas. So, uh, we c Yes, okay, we, we can find it private. <laughs> <laughs> um, Magea is a project that did fork for Mandriva and, uh, in September 2010, and we are a purely community-driven project. We don't have any commercial background, we don't have any company, uh, we live only by donations we get, so there isn't any sponsor. So uh, if anybody has a few euro left, uh, <laughs> come by our stand. And <laughs> So again, we are a separate entity to Canonical. The only backing we get and support we get is through CDs or conference packs. So if a team is organizing a conference, <laughs> be them our approved team or an unapproved team, um, they get a conference pack from Canonical. And that could be a case of CDs, lanyards, and stickers. What that team does with them, um, if they want to sell them for a euro or two euros each, that's up to the loco team. And as I said, me personally, I think that's a good idea because the team then has a little bit of extra cash if they want to have uh, maybe some pizzas or to buy some t-shirts or to buy the next lot of CDs to burn CDs, that's fine with it, to be honest. Uh, I'd be interested to see if there's any more comments from the audience. On the yes. Point of local on local teams, <laughs> specifically local teams. 
No, I'd like to know what you believe does not work well at all. Because pretty much everyone has been selling the good sides. I think we can rather learn from mistakes and bad experiences in the past. Well, in Fedora, so definitely it's the budget thing that does not work good and the, then the trademark thing. That is definitely the biggest issue. We get money from Red Hat, but it's a lot of bu bureaucracy and that's why the, the relationship, or overall the relationship between the commercial Red Hat side and the uh, contributors, the community contributors is... Um, it's uh, we, we both need each other, but sometimes it's uh, a little hard to work together. That's the crucial thing. It's going, it's going to become better because it's mixing many Red Hat employees even get engaged in Fedora in their free time. and So things are getting better, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be fixed. And I'm, yeah, we, the, the legal stuff is boring, I know, but it needs to be done and we need to work on that. <coughs> No. Jörg, uh, the, question, uh, the question was whether one of us works for Red Hat. No, we don't. Uh, Jörg is allowed, Jörg has a credit card from Red Hat. Uh, um, and he had to sign a lot of paperwork and he, that's to, he needs to file budget reports and he needs to know, oh, the dinner is booked on this cost center and this is booked on that cost center. So this is a lot of paperwork and uh, this really sucks. So this needs to be improved. Just a comment on, on that. I so we are not commercial at all. We are a completely independent organization in Debian, but <coughs> that does not relieve people from filing receipts or this kind of stuff. In fact, I believe that if you spend money that are donated to us, you need to be even more clear on <coughs> being sure that there are receipts and all this kind of stuff. So of course, it's not like uh, we have budget reports, but still people will be reimbursed only if they have a receipt and this kind of stuff. Because otherwise, you risk to waste the money that people donated to you. But for example, the money you raise at this event, you sell y all these t-shirts and, and stuff, uh, where does it go? Do you have a bank account? Who is the bank account holder? Do you have a legal so entity we, for that? As I briefly mentioned, we have various organizations around the world, mainly because if you have only one in a specific country, then you, you need to do money conversion and the kind of stuff. So we have Debian Constitution as a notion of Debian trusted organization, which are organization which are which we trust. Okay, and we can update the list saying, okay, we trust you also, and or you don't, we don't trust you anymore. And these organizations are legal entity which can hold assets that exist in the real, in, let's say, in the legal world, like money, like uh, usually they are non-profit organization, like trademarks and this kind of stuff. And usually they respond to what the project, usually by the mean of the Debian project leader, ask them to do. So when there is a reimbursement to do, the Debian project leader approves it, and then these organizations proceed and do their reimbursement. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, often reimbursement doesn't work uh, for poor countries. We we have uh, Indian people who we want to have at our uh, conferences or uh, at our developer meetings, uh, and they cannot afford to prepay something, so we have to pay for them. And I think the credit cards, uh, besides all the paperwork, is, it is an improvement. Uh, uh, compared to the situation that we had, uh, yeah, years before. But, I mean, go ahead. So just to get back onto Pascal's question, um, so things that work and things that don't work. Um, about four years ago, the local council didn't exist. It was just the community council operated all of the boards, um, and that was kind of unattainable because as the community grew, there was nothing else to help everybody other group. So we got the IRC council, the forums council, and the local council. So there's six of us elected to look after specifically local teams. And that means we actually have more time, more energy to look after local teams rather than one <coughs> council looking after all of the teams. So that's something that we've had to learn. And, and as a community, we've grown. Um, within the community council ourselves, we've um, had to look at the way we do approving teams. So teams have to show that they are more than um, a log, more than just a group of FOSS enthusiasts, that so they're actually promoting Ubuntu. Um, so they come for a, a monthly meeting to, for, for, to be approved, and they have to show and document on a wiki page how they are active photographs, blogs, you know, show they actually are taking part. Um, and that was one meeting a, a month, and that wasn't working out. So two cycles ago, we realized that, you know, having a, a monthly meeting wasn't working, so we do things through bug tracking, and that's worked out. But again, it is a learning curve for us all, because as the community grows, our, our local teams are growing, and that also means multiple time zones as well, so we need to fully appreciate that. Um, we are an IRC the whole time, so we have a factoid. It's just small little things that you actually grow that you mightn't have realized two years ago. Well, you know, they can just email us, and then you have to realize it's also a language barrier. 
Um, so the six of us, and not everybody speaks English. There are three in Europe and three in the States, and that's just because it's not that we wasn't even active in Asia. It was just that people who were nominated were the most active from those countries. Um, it's not ideal. We would like to have more people from other countries, but as the, t as the community grows, we get more people involved in the greater community. Uh, it will help. So governance, I think, is a, is a big key issue for us, I think, and, and I think for uh, any community growing up, if you can put in the foundations first of what you would like to see happening, that if you have a main community and break it into sub areas, if you can put that road work in before everything gets kind of skewed, it will kind of save you a lot of headache in, in the future. Okay, thank you, Laura. Something that doesn't work in OpenSUSE? Uh, in the ambassador program, actually, most of the things does not work correctly. Oh, that's an honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we are trying to fix uh, nowadays. Uh, we're, we, we don't like that. We, we don't have uh, many strong local communities because uh, most of the people in OpenSUSE uh, work in the global project rather than uh, organizing uh, local groups. Uh, we're trying to change that uh, by writing tons of documentation and after correcting the documentation we wrote. Uh, we kind of have some financial uh, control. Uh, me and Isabel wrote a program about that. Was, yeah, we have, we have the same problem with, with India. Uh, although we get uh, the funding, uh, we try to keep the funding only in uh, local uh, traveling and uh, not uh, sponsoring uh, people uh, for doing uh, trips outside their country, so uh, that uh, we strength, we give strength to the local communities. Uh, well, if uh, open source community would be human, it would be a teenager nowadays, because uh, we have uh, people uh, constantly arguing about uh, how things should go. Uh, the good thing in that point is that uh, in open source we have a meritocracy, so uh, those who decide are those who, who actually work on the project. Uh, so in all of uh, that uh, bad cloud uh, we have, we have meritocracy that actually help, help us uh, evolve. And we hope in about six, eight months to okay. take a, to be just, on the stage. Just on that. Just on that. Cool. I think we still have one left. You still need to tell us what doesn't work in your community. <coughs> okay. You don't have slides. <laughs> uh, now, what doesn't work in, in the Magellan community? Um, first and foremost, what didn't work was uh, setting up a centralized organization for the local communities because it was just forgotten because there was so much else to do. Um, this is an error we would like to, uh, to uh, fix um, and to get in touch with uh, the local communities we know about and to find out if there are any out there we don't know about. So um, what doesn't work is um, most of us uh, are not le really experienced in building a worldwide community. So um, we may uh, just do loads of things that are not done in the best way, but we are learning and uh, we are taking uh, advice from our users and the members of the worldwide community series and try to fix what doesn't work. Okay, pass it along here and... Um. <coughs> yeah, uh, <coughs> the language barrier was an interesting question. What I was thinking about is that to become officially uh, involved in gender, you need to you manage you know, English uh, so that you're able to communicate with the product at large. But thinking about, uh, thinking about if that is a limiting factor in, for example, Asia, if you think about it, it's mo mostly Europe and North America where the most people are centered, but it, it could also be just a question that open source communities in general in some areas are not as big as in uh, Europe and North America. But I don't know if uh, you, uh, other people have uh, people involved in Asia, if you can comment on if it's a language or open source culture uh, issue in general. Okay, um, I think we should continue with a quick round of questions from the audience because we are running out of time. We have like five minutes left, I think. Officially, we can uh, extend this in this uh, room, but there are most likely people who want to talk, uh, attend other talks, so let's hurry up. Your question, please. No questions? Hi, I have a question about um, how do you work with uh, non-technical people or less technical people? Do you, do you split communities? Do you keep them together with the developers? How do you deal with them? 
So um, I'm, I'm not a developer, um, very vocal about that. But um, we have developers and non-developers working side by side in logo teams. Um, all our channels are Ubuntu Dash namespace, and the same for our logo team. So in the Ubuntu Dash desktop channel, for example, you have canonical developers and logo team people who are active in, say, bug triaging, working side by side. Um, as a non-developer, um, I report bugs. Anybody can report a bug. You don't have to be technical to report a bug. Um, we make translations very easy via Launchpad. It's click a button. It's very simple. And we try and get people who are not developers looking at those two areas. Um, also getting involved in documentation. You might find the most person who's not a developer is really good at reading English or really good at reading their own spe specific language and spotting typos. And you get them involved slowly. And you get them involved that way. And, and that's how they become more involved in the open source community, to be honest. You don't have to scare them saying you have to be a developer to be involved in a community because, quite frankly, that means you're pushing away some of your other community, and that's not very fair. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm not a developer either. I'm a firefighter. I have <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, we're using, uh, using people. Uh, if someone wants to contribute uh, in the community, all, uh, the only thing that he has is to want to contribute in the community. We have people that uh, don't know English and help us with, with the booths. Uh, we have people that uh, make translations. Uh, we have people uh, that make graphics. Uh, we have a, a, a free software project uh, an or an open source project needs uh, people to do a lot of uh, work. Uh, and nowadays, uh, open source has a lot of programmers, but not people that uh, are graphic uh, that do graphics. Uh, don't have have uh, n always needs translators. Okay, uh, always needs people uh, to go to events because. What I see personally in Greece is that uh, the only people that uh, have booths in Greece are Federa and uh, OpenSUSE mainly in most of the events. Other communities are not so active. Not so active, they are, the Ubuntu community in Greece is uh, the most active community in the internet, but uh, at some uh, points they don't have booths and something like that. We, we use uh, people to, to make all kinds of stuff, uh, to cover all the communities. Okay, um, no, there are quite some things that non-technical people can do. For example, uh, the biggest team we have in a non-technical area is uh, internationalization. You don't have to be a technical person to translate anything. If it's a website translation, blog translation, or ex actually the translation of uh, our tools. Um, the next one is artwork. You don't have to be a technical person to create a wallpaper or an icon or something like that. And we have marketing, we have communication, um, we have a documentation team. Okay, you should be a bit technical to write documentation, but uh, you don't have to be a developer or a packager to write good documentation. Rather different, uh, most developers do not write good documentation. Um, <coughs> now, soon we are opening up uh, localized wikis, uh, so people can write wiki pages in their own languages up until now we do only have a, an English wiki and we will try to have people from the internationalization team that have a look at those localized wikis and see for good documentation in the localized wiki and translate that back to English so it will be available for everyone else. Um, I know that's going to be a hard job for yeah, I18N but um, they elected me as team leader so they have no choice. Um, and I think if you really want to, to help something, you can actually find something. But we did notice it's actually easier to get technical people than non-technical people into the project. Um, getting a packager is easy. Getting a good designer is hard. Uh, <clears throat> I think the proper answer is uh, do not differentiate as much as possible. I can change you. We list everyone under the developer list, no matter what they do. Um, no, well, it's a smaller project, so uh, 200 people in total listed there. So, so, so.
Yeah, this is one reason why we have ambassadors, uh, because ambassadors are also mentors um, to help non-technical people to find a way inside the Fedora project. Of course, we have all the opportunities to do artwork, marketing, and such stuff. Uh, but uh, I think it's really important to know a person in the project uh, who knows the way around the project to find the right place for this non-technical person. So I think it's really important to have some people who can show where, you, uh, where they can do non-technical work. I think this is really important. Okay, I think there were two more questions in the background somewhere. Raise your hand. Question already solved. Okay, then it's your turn. We will repeat it. Okay. It doesn't make sense to run around all the time. Um, I think Spot can tell this, uh, answer these questions in the in the next uh, track. We should repeat the question okay. first. The, the question was about uh, uh, infrastructure. If the infrastructure is run by the company or by the sponsor, or if we. Okay, so if people are looking, if we are looking for sysadmins to to uh, take care of our infrastructure, um so uh, just um, I'm 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 not a specific target for your question, but in Debian we have volunteers doing the amazing uh, work of doing the sysadmin treasure. They will be there in the next session, and I must say that raising a, let's say a team or a generation of sysadmin to to run your own infrastructure is very important, and it's a, a great achievement that projects should look for to be independent from the possibly the main sponsor of the project. Um, so with Ubuntu, um, all the resources of the wiki, the websites, they're all hosted on canonical servers. Um, so it does have pros and cons about it, to be honest. Um, all the wikis is great, it's very handy, but sometimes for translations, teams aren't really happy with that, even though you can translate a wiki, but for some of the fonts and for the writing languages, it isn't so easy, they hold their own wikis. Uh, for the websites, um, the, maybe the wrong theme is there and the the local teams don't have access to that, so they have to log um, tickets to get updates for the Drupal websites. Um, teams may or may not like that, and they go off and get their own hosting. They have the option of doing that. Um, but yeah, so the community has nothing to do with the servers, and I think the canonical like doing their own servers, so we have a separation there. We're the lucky ones here. Uh, we're hosted by SUSE and SUSE servers. I don't know about sysadmin, sysadmins. I don't know if uh, we have volunteer sysadmins or our SUSE people. We have a few. So anyway, we, ha <laughs> we have a few. <laughs> okay. Uh, the thing here is uh, that uh, we, it is pretty easy for local teams to work uh, in uh, OpenSUSE Wiki. And uh, in, uh, if uh, any local team wants a forum, uh, like we have the Greek forum, you just ask for the people and they give you so we don't actually have any problem in infrastructure no, no, in technical infrastructure anyway. again the forums again are hosted by canonical we don't have any issues if we have um off software updates or we just log or t tickets and canonical take care of it for us there's a good relationship between community and canonical right okay It is. You don't want. So, you don't so maybe for like uh, maybe, maybe I can say something about Fedora in infrastructure. Red Hat does appoint a Fedora infrastructure leader, who is coordinating the efforts around it. Uh, but uh, you can join the infrastructure team and you can really break things as a community member. The Fedora infrastructure leader is a full-time job. It's a Red Hat employee. Um, he gets paid by Red Hat. So, but nevertheless. All the websites, uh, everything, it's run by, uh, by the community. They, we, ha we have a Fedora admin uh, uh, IRC channel there, all the, uh, around the clock, 24-7. I think the Fedora project uh, homepage has, uh, we had less updates, uh, up, uh, downtimes than Microsoft.com uh, run with a completely community-run uh, project. <coughs> okay. Uh, the question wasn't really intended for me since I have 
no company that is doing anything. So we have a, a quite great sysadmin team that does work on our servers, that does manage our servers, and uh, they're really using up quite much of the free time. Uh, we had a big server upgrade now where four people had to go to Marseille and uh, look at those servers uh, directly because hardware had to be uh, changed. And I think uh, as a community team, uh, a community project, there is no other way. You have to look after them yourself. Yeah, <clears throat> it's the same in Chengdu, but that wasn't the point of the question anyway. Okay, I see there was another question over here. Uh, what about a contributor's coordination? Uh, what uh, those people uh, work with so-called bounties, with proposing an amount of money for doing that and that, and are people doing that, and is it working? Okay, I just repeat the question. It was about uh, the, the coordination between the contributors and especially about bounties, um, so about having a certain goal and uh, paying a certain amount of money for the person or for the team who gets this goal implemented, right? Um, I can say, no, we don't have that in Fedora. Next. Uh, are you involved in Google Summer of Code? Well, it's sort of a bounty. Fedora is uh, registered at a, as an organization in Google Summer of Code. We did some mentoring, um, but uh, it's not used that much, to be honest. Uh, um, also, the, what is the other Google Code in? That's all purely a bounty program, uh, supposedly. Yeah, but, yeah, but well, it depends how you define bounty, I guess. But, but it, it has nothing to do with uh, the project. It's a Google uh, kind of project. Um, OK, actually. We don't have any money to give as a bounty to anyone uh, <coughs> because we do need our money to uh, to keep the, the organization as a whole running. Uh, so no, we don't do it. Um, and the organization between the contributors is done in the council because every team has a representative in the council. So we do the organization and the cooperation there. So we, we don't have any bounty in Debian. We are quite proud of being a volunteer project. So there are, of course, people paid by their own employees to work on Debian, but this is something which is not coordinated by the project. And I must say that for me, it's quite an interesting challenge to see a, a project based on volunteers to try to compete with other projects which are complete, a lot backed by companies. Uh, we don't either have uh, people that are getting paid to do volunteering job, except uh, SUSI employees. But uh, I don't know how this works for SUSE. I, be I believe that uh, most of OpenSUSE employees are vol volunteering to the OpenSUSE community and not uh, otherwise. Uh, but I, I don't really know that. We have, uh, I think the only people that are getting paid in OpenSUSE are uh, the project manager, the, uh, com the community manager, okay? And, and AJ, who is, and Coolio, uh, anyway. I don't. I have. We have two or three people getting paid, but they are SUSE employees that they are actually here to help the community. Nobody other gets it's getting paid. Um, no, there's no such thing as the bounty kind of thing in Ubuntu. Um, I mean, people take part in helping Ubuntu, uh, be it like so. The local team portal was created um, with the help of actually people from Florida and different teams worldwide building it, developing on it. We had some help from Canonical at one point. Um, people can apply for sponsorship um, twice a year to attend a Ubuntu Developer Summit, um, but not everybody gets it. So there's no such thing as really as a bounty, to be honest. Anybody okay. else for questions? One final question. Time's up. I mean, time is up, yes. In fact, we are already like eight minutes over time. <laughs> okay. Okay, then um, I I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs>